at Medi1 TV Morocco. And on behalf of IFC, I welcome you all to this showcase on African women startups and entrepreneurs. I am very delighted to see that there are a lot of women in the audience. I hope some may also join us for, for, for this session because they are as concerned as uh, females. The objectives of the coming high-level session are first to unpack the challenges faced by women entrepreneurs across the continent, but also uh, we will also go through solutions that can support them to face those challenges. I will not be long for my introduction, but there are some numbers that really caught my uh, attention while preparing this, this session. The first one is one African entrepreneur in four is a woman. On the other hand, only 4% of startup funding of Africa go to female-led startups. So there is clearly something wrong concerning those two numbers. And actually access to finance, financing or funding is not peculiar and unique to startups. And that's why uh, a major challenge sometimes is within the entrepreneur. And this is also to be considered. So how to ramp up support for women-owned tech startups? We will try to get most of the answers and efficient answers for this question on this session. IFC, as a global leader in advancing women's empowerment, is indeed and in fact a partner of choice for leveraging women's entrepreneurship across Africa. In this respect, ladies and gentlemen, there will be an important announcement by the end of this session. And I won't say more, so you better stay. Without further ado, let me introduce our two first speakers for a fireside chat about powering women's entrepreneurship for growth. I invite to join me on stage, and it's a privilege for me to welcome her on stage, Her Excellency Monica Gengos, First Lady of the Republic of Namibia, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Before assuming the first lady role, uh, Mrs. Gengos was a co-shareholder and managing director of Namibia's largest private equity fund and played a meaningful role in private sector development. And she also received numerous merit awards, such as the Namibian Business Personality of the Year, the most innovative entrepreneur, and the list is very long. Very honored to have this dis discussion with you, Your Excellency. And to... It's a pleasure, also an honor, to introduce Mohamed Goulet, Vice President Industries for IFC. You can applause him. He's, so Goulet, please, to be seated here. So he's responsible for managing IFC's global sector communities of practice and ensuring that lessons of experience from IFC operations contribute to the World Bank Group, a Global Knowledge Bank and Thought Leadership. Thank you again. Thank you for joining us today. Your Excellency, women play a critical role, definitely, in driving Africa's socioeconomic growth. But it's a fact, and it's not as for today. They are facing, they face, they are facing, still facing challenges in different manners, in, especially in accessing opportunities. So what is your view on the state of women's entrepreneurship uh, in Africa, given these challenges? Thank you. So the, the state of um, women's leadership and participation um, in entrepreneurship in Africa is, is um, reflective of social realities. So if you've got societies where women's roles haven't clearly been identified, respected, and upheld, you will find that disparity manifesting itself in all spheres, um, whether it's access to health, education, even access to funding and entrepreneurship uh, possibilities. So I think it, it's, it's really just a mirror of the society that we live in, and we want to fix a lot of these problems. We need to fix this um, patriarchal fault line that operates in many of our countries, but we, we must never categorize this as an African country, as an African problem. Um, it's a global problem. 
that, that, that needs fixing. So that is really, to me, the status of women's entrepreneurship. Yes, indeed. And it's like uh, a domino if, uh, effect, uh, especially when it comes to other aspects of, uh, of, uh, of the life of the, those African ladies. So, Mohammed, I was, I was mentioning this in, during my introduction. So women-owned businesses raised significantly less capital than startups led by only uh, men. There is definitely more that needs to be done. So how can large DFIs uh, like IFC that you're presenting strengthen, strengthen this momentum uh, and what are the challenges that need to be addressed to increase investments in women-led uh, businesses? Thank you, Khadija, and uh, it's an immense pleasure and an honor to, to, to be on this panel today, uh, especially uh, besides uh, Her Excellency, the First Lady of uh, Namibia. Uh, the fact that we are sitting uh, around here and discussing a business case uh, for why uh, we should invest in women by itself is a fallacy. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and the economics uh, indicate to us otherwise. Uh, we are uh, looking for growth uh, sources everywhere. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we have uh, a, the whole potential of unlocking women-owned businesses that can make a significant contribution to that growth. Uh, I think this is not a question of, uh, you know, whether it's a moral imperative to finance business owned, business owned by women. It makes economic sense. We have to do it for, uh, for, for the good of growth and the economy. Uh, besides facing the challenges of this bigger moral imperative, uh, so, uh, IFC is committed uh, and has identified gender financing as a strategic priority. Uh, we uh, specifically target uh, financing women-owned businesses, coming up with products that look at women-owned businesses and look at the potential, but also mentoring, uh, at helping women uh, get advice, but also access to financing. And we think about how to facilitate that. So overall, IFC's commitment to, uh, to, to, to this space is unparalleled, and uh, it's only going to get uh, stronger. And to that, uh, to that point, uh, we've just upgraded, in fact, our uh, uh, gender department uh, to, to a department at the director level, uh, like, uh, like many other departments that we have. So we, we've been talking about finan financing, and I'm, I believe that uh, on, on the second uh, part of this session, we will be tackling this issue because it is an issue for any uh, entrepreneur, whether uh, it, it is a woman or, or a man. But before Mrs. Uh, Gengos, what are other areas beyond access to finance uh, do you think need to be addressed to unlock and scale women's entrepreneurship on the continent? You know, we've been telling each other for a long time that it makes absolute economic sense to ensure that women entrepreneurship is, is well funded, but we're not there. We're not close to that. Um, if you asked me 15 years ago what I felt, for instance, about gender quotas, I would have said no, um, it should be merit-based, and I had a whole long story about why um, quotas won't work, but I've changed my mind. And, and why I've changed my mind on that, um, and let me use the political representation of women in Namibia. One year, it was 27%, and the following year, it was 49%. What changed that? It was a quota that the ruling party enforced that said there has to be 50-50% female representation. We don't care what or how. I know that uh, Cote d'Ivoire has a 30% quota that they're currently enforcing. So I think when it comes to the funding landscape, Mohammed's bonus, one of the metrics that his KPIs should be measuring 
is how many women businesses have you funded? And there should be a quota. Maybe an answer to that. <laughs> it is uh, the first lady is absolutely right. And I do have actually a KPI. But maybe that KPI should be uh, strengthened. <laughs> Yeah, as a matter of fact, how, what are, is there any kind of magic maybe way to, to drive capital flows to, to Africa and to rely more investors into women-owned uh, businesses in Africa? And can you challenge, as you have just been challenged, I give you the opportunity to challenge the investors present in the, in the room today. So uh, we do know. Uh, that 85% of uh, startup financing uh, is going to uh, male led founders business. Uh, and the question is why? Uh, I think men have to realize because on the other side of the table, uh, the majority are men who make those investment decisions. Uh, it, it's, it's really sometimes comes down to as, as simple as that. But we have to challenge the financiers, the investors, mostly male, to be, to be looking at women-owned uh, uh, startups and enterprises through the lens of gender. Uh, it's, I hear a lot that you know, the way women make their pitch and presentations when they go for to, to investors is different than the way men do it. Uh, men present uh, blue sky scenarios, a lot of ambition. Uh, women tend to under promise and over deliver. It's a, it's, it's, it's a cultural element that comes into play. And therefore, I think men and women should not be blamed for that. It's on, that, on the contrary. Men should adapt to, uh, to how they read women's pitch when, 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 they are put, when these are put in front of them. So, uh, so, yeah, the challenge for me, for the investors, is uh, change your lenses when you have a, a female entrepreneur uh, or a female uh, venture capitalist in front of you. And understand what their presentations really mean. Uh, don't just make a direct comparison to the men's. Uh, and finally, what I would say is uh, think about uh, uh, the questions that you ask. I think uh, research shows that when women come in front of uh, investors, they are asked questions that are more risk-oriented, whereas men are asked questions that are more growth-oriented. So that tells you uh, some of the biases. They're not cliches, like this is reality. And um, uh, I'm sure we'll be dis discussing this with the uh, uh, female-led uh, startups that are represented on the panel uh, in a few minutes as this session is coming to an end. Maybe a final thought, Your Excellency, uh, maybe toward the future. And now we're, we're talking about the present time, maybe something about future. I, I think the future is determined by the now. Um, and right now, I think the scale and the speed at which we're doing things um, on gender equity at all levels um, is, is, is simply not there. But I just want to reflect quickly of um, having exited the, the, the private equity space, uh, being a bit older now. My, my eldest son is 28, my daughter is 23. And I think an aspect that we don't speak often enough when we are on these platforms, I think is also the social consequences of entrepreneurship for women and what it does to our children, to our families, to our relationships. And it shouldn't be that we pay such a high social cost as women in order to have successful businesses. And I think I've, I've experienced the success, but certainly my 28-year-old or my 23-year-old, the minute they struggle, Life is tough. I always wonder, is it not because I spend so much time building business? Because when you appear in front of these investors and all they want is for you to focus on risk and manage and mitigate risk, 
it, it also requires me to take um, life decisions that impact my family, that impact my relationships. And I think we must speak about these issues um, as, as, as much as we speak about the access to fin finance issues and the challenges of um, entrepreneurship in general. Thank you, Excellency. Mohamed, maybe, maybe a final thought? One word. I think uh, the social return on capital uh, when it comes to investing in a woman-owned enterprise and a, a male-owned enterprise, significantly different. And, uh, and, and we know which one is higher, so I'll stop there. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Mohamed. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you for this. Uh, and actually, we are into the, the, the topic. Thank you for this really inspiring fireside chat to to proceed to the second part of this <clears throat> session, which is a panel conversation. And I will start by introducing three entrepreneurs, uh, because we are, we are talking about entrepreneurship. First, uh, Dr. Hanan Shaibain, CEO and co-founder of Biotesia, a company centered around access to all diagnostic and genetic testing, oncology and biosample collection in rural and underserved populations with the vision of making point of care testing faster, cheaper and accessible to all patients. Dr. Hanan Shaibain, ladies and gentlemen. And from Egypt, Yasmin Abdel Karim, co founder of Yalla Fil Sikka. Uh, she's 15 years international uh, experienced uh, in uh, the energy sector, specifically in the oil and gas industry. And uh, let's all welcome her warmly. Okay. And um, Clara. I'm lost in my notes. Je suis perdu dans mes notes, okay, Clara. Would you mind present yourself because I can't find your bio on my... Uh, I'm really sorry. Don't take it... <laughs> really sorry. Clara um, Wanjiku. My name is Clara. I am the co-founder and CEO of Credrails, which is an open banking startup. Um, focused on connecting bank, mobile money, and offline data into a single API. Um, before starting Credrails, I have worked at Flutterwave, Rapid, and Neom, so two unicorns, one decacorn. Um, great experience working in fintech, and very excited to be a founder, and great to be here. And to share your experience. I wouldn't have done it be be better than you did it. Thank you, and thank you for your comprehension. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Managing Director and CEO of the Aliko Dangote Foundation and very inspiring lady, Zuera Yusufu. Maybe a word about the Aliko Dangote Foundation, the largest private foundation in Sub-Saharan Africa based in Lagos, Nigeria. Mrs. Yusufu leads the foundation's effort to improve the health, nutrition, education, and economic power empowerment outcomes for African and African ladies as well. Ladies and gentlemen, my, uh, the fifth speaker for this panel is Taha Nathan, Executive Vice President, Humanitarian and Development Sector of MasterCard. MasterCard. This is Nathan. Tara actually founded MasterCard Community Pass, which is a social impact business that digitally enables uh, scalable delivery of uh, critical services, including education, health, commerce, identity, and humanitarian aid. So first question to you, Zoera. <laughs> Surprise. 
uh, women's entrepreneurship is on the rise uh, in Africa with, uh, with women being more likely to start businesses than anywhere else in the world. So what, what would be maybe to give us an idea about those challenges? Her Excellency and Mohammed mentioned some of those challenges and maybe there are more that maybe we, we don't talk enough about. What, what would be those challenges from your perspective and your stance? <laughs> So thank you, thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, and I didn't expect to go first. <laughs> the ones actually uh, doing it would be, from my personal experience, um, the issues have not changed. So I joined IFC in 2005, and Mohammed, who just spoke um, now, was one of the people who made the whole idea of IFC focusing on access to finance to women work. So he was the, at the time he was an investment officer and he did the first deal that we ever did at IFC to support women entrepreneurs. So he's gotten it since 2005. And today that, you know, there's a directorship and Mohammed's on a panel talking about women entrepreneurs just makes me feel really good that, you know, the institution has been true to it. But the sad thing is the issues are the same. They're still the same. Last week I was in um, India. I'm on the board of Women's World Banking. And we were talking about financial inclusion for women. And the same barriers, the same barriers from 2005 are still the same barriers today. So we're still talking about women not having, you can't hear me? Uh, better now? OK. OK. Um, the issues are still the same 15, 20 years later. We're still talking about women not having enough access to credit. We're still talking about women not having the same access to networks. We're still talking about women not having access to as big a share of the PE funds, the VC funds, commercial lending, et cetera. And the only thing that we're still talking about is that women don't uh, perceive or manage risk the same way men do. We're still talking about how do we upskill the lenders to understand the perspective of women. But I also think we need to focus a lot on getting women to understand what is required. I think it's one thing to say we want the, the, the VCs to be open to a presentation by a woman, but I think for women to understand what that particular organization is looking for is where success comes. Because we have companies, right, run by women that have been funded by VCs in Silicon Valley, here in Africa, everywhere. It happens every day. It's just not happening enough. And that gap between how do you present yourself to an organization so they can receive what you're saying, and then how can the organization receive what you're saying so they understand um, what you're presenting, that mismatch is what we're still struggling with today, from my perspective. It's just like uh, Mohammed was uh, explaining for the a w a woman pitching in front of investors. Maybe she doesn't have the codes, the right codes to pitch well to those investors. It can be male or female, but mainly male. Exactly. So not only do you have to have the codes for that particular pitch, they also have to understand what you're coming from. So the the the, the communication between the two entities, the lender and the borrower, from my perspective, is where we're still struggling. And there's more work to be done in that particular space. It can't just be on women. Okay, go learn how to you know, talk to the organizations like how guys do. That's not fair or realistic. But at the same time, there's work that women have to do to be up to snuff in the conversations. And the organizations also have to make an effort to understand what the women are talking about. And as long as we don't have women on the lending side, we're not going to make uh, progress. Yeah, I, I see that uh, those entrepreneurs with us are, are totally OK with that. Hanan, so you participated. I mean, we have been talking about IFC's initiatives. And you have actually participated and won. Uh, uh, as uh, uh, IFC-led She Wins Arabia uh, program, what was the most impactful aspect of, of this participation and of, of, of that program that you, you would say made the difference for you and your business? 
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa ta'ala wa barakatuh. I would like to first start by um, uh, thanking the Republic of Côte d'Ivoire for welcoming us today. Um, I would like to also thank Jeanne Afrique, the entire Jeanne Afrique team, for uh, founding this beautiful event. Uh, Her uh, uh, Excellency, the First Lady of Namibia, and uh, Madame Khadija Ihsan for mo moderating this panel. I would like now to thank fondly the entire IFC team, whether IFC Rabat, Washington DC, MENA region, Africa, for their wonderful support and dedication to the gender um, initiative and putting gender at the heart of their mission and changing mindsets. Especially uh, when we know that, for example, in 2021, uh, African female-led ventures uh, raised $188 million, which is only 4% of the startup funding, while African male-led uh, ventures raised $4.6 billion. So there is a huge gap. Um, being part of the uh, first cohort of She Wins Arabia, the top 10 uh, female entrepreneurs out of 80 female entrepreneurs, um, was a true honor, was a game changer, and very impactful to our business, to our business, because it has provided the support and mentorship that was needed as a startup, the uh, financial opportunities, the networking, uh, the exposure and visibility, as well as the wealth of knowledge that is needed as a startup to make sure that you're investment ready, um, that you have the wealth of knowledge and to connect you with potential investors as well through matchmaking activities, pitch practice sessions to make sure that you are ready to, before you go in front of investors, um, as well as uh, ensure that your pitch is well executed, well structured as well. So I really, I sincerely believe that it is through initiatives like this that we're going to change and impact the gender disparities and, 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 and clearly shift the narratives. Thank you. Thank you, Hanan. So clearly entrepreneurship support is a key element for that any business and especially women-led business to grow. Uh, so Clara, what would you say that work or doesn't work to, for women-owned businesses from your, of course, experience? Um, so women are not broken, I think is the first thing that I want to say. There's a huge idea that we need to pitch differently, we need to speak differently, and we need to do everything differently. But if a majority of women are starting businesses, these businesses are successful, maybe the problem isn't us, it's the people that we're speaking to. Um, that's something I truly believe. I don't think I would have gotten to this point in my life if I was less than anyone else. I've been able to compete, and so women can compete. Um, the things that have been helpful are actually a program from IFC. I was telling um, Zoya about this. Um, in 2006, they had, um, it was called GEM, um, and they had female entrepreneurs, and there was a TV show, and I remember one in particular called Gahaya Lynx, and I knew I wanted to be like that woman. So this was 18 years ago, 17, 18 years ago, and here we are. So seeing other women be entrepreneurs has been very important. It's the messaging that we can do it, that you can run an international business. All has been really important. Also allies. Um, a big problem is the network, having access to the funders. Um, I have SoftBank as an investor, and I got that because a friend recommended me um, for a program that they were having. So when the men in your life, when the people with if power open the doors for you, that's been very helpful. Um, and I would also say seeing that sometimes I'm not the problem, it's everybody else, has been very helpful in this life to just help me keep going because if I was the problem, then it wouldn't be a global issue, if that makes sense. So it's something that every woman faces, and so it's not us, it's them. <laughs> yeah. And they're definitely not broken, on the contrary. Uh, Yasmin, what kind of support um, do women startups need, and how can the support be more um, targeted to enable them to access financing? Hi, 
Hi, uh, my name is Yasmin, I'm Egyptian. Um, I grew and studied and made all my uh, education in Egypt, but then I got transferred to Aberdeen, Scotland, France, and then now I came back to Egypt. Um, thank you, Clara, for making my speech easier, <laughs> because I agree with everything you said. Um, I think I'm gonna take it from a different angle, and at least this is how I personally view it. Um, I am not in agreement with the word empowering women. I don't understand, I mean, I do appreciate this, is the initiative of it. I don't know why do we need empowerment. Um, I think we are empowered. I think um, it's more on the look at the business model and don't look at my gender. So if you have a good business model, if you have great numbers, if you have a, a CAGR or a growth that is uh, substantially good, in the end, on the other side of the, of the table, these are investors, they want to invest their money and they want to have an ROI that will make them profitable and your business successful. So they would invest in you. I mean, when we're speaking to investors, there is a different mindset here, which is like, we, you create this formal, which is the fear of missing out. If you were not put your money in my business, you are not going to have your ROI. You will miss out on a very, very big opportunity. So I think more of it is a mindset. And I totally agree with you. Is If it was me or her, it's not going to be a global problem. Actually, 4% for Africa, 2% globally for access to financing. But I think it's both ways because, yes, investors do lean to invest more in men because it's fast, it's quick, they know what they're speaking about, they're getting. But also on the other side, there are a lot of investors that they do have an internal KPIs or goals to invest in women and they cannot find women that they could invest in. Either the connection of these women did not come to the investors where the networking comes in or the women didn't think of themselves and believed in themselves that they could pitch to this, oh, it's a bond investor or it's IFC, the team are all economists and all of that. And uh, I will not be able to present. So I think it's more of a mindset from both sides. Uh, let's focus on the business model and how the growth, so not the gender. And the women as well to believe in themselves and say, okay, you know, I'll go pitch. If it doesn't go well, it doesn't go well, and we go. So um, myself raised $10 million for the, for the startup. It doesn't mean that the minute I called the investor, they invested. I had 160 investors that turned me down. You only need one or two or three or five. You don't need the 200, but you have to reach out to the 200 or the 300 to get. Have I thought, oh, the, it's 100 people that turned down and it's my business model, uh, I wouldn't have been able to raise the money. So I think it's a mindset on both sides. This is what I personally believe. But what would change this mindset? Because we've been talking about changing the mindsets, but, and what we were discussing a few minutes before the session starts with Zoera, is that actions, and for the case of Clara, is a role model. She saw a lady on, the, on TV and she got inspired. And so, Maybe, or uh, I would say, uh, um, and there's also this um, cliche about what sector is it like the social impact sector, uh, entrepreneurs that are specific to women, Zuera. So, so we, we have all this, what, what the first lady said earlier about how Fi access to finance, business, entrepreneurship, political representation, they're a mirror of how our societies are, right? So if we are still raising boys to be go-getters and fighters, and we're raising girls to be, you know, playing with dolls and be a housewife, why are we surprised that when we're adults, the girls find it difficult to be gregarious in front of a, a, a panel interrogating them versus a boy? Right, so it's the, the, the shifting of this mindset is like a societal global change that we have to have. But what I'm saying is the, the, the reality of our lives is that the, the deep 
inequality between men and women is a global issue, whether we're talking about pay gap, whether we're talking about access to education, to health, to everything, right? So access to finance is just one more thing. But it's a thing that has tools that can help. Right? So when I listen to your testimony, right? So IFC supporting you, working with you with, through the pitch to the point where when you're presenting your product, it's not like a women-owned business or a women-led idea. It's just a good idea. And the investors are looking for good ideas. We have biases. Oh, women are all in the clothing business and tiny businesses and small and nails and, you know, a lot of really dismissive uh, mindsets that we have about women entrepreneurs that are just not connected to the reality that we see. So we keep hearing, yes, one in what four entrepreneurs in Africa is a woman. Yeah, but how many of them are funded? How many of them have growth capacity? How many of them have access to the networks that would help them take it to the next level? You were able to do it. You were able to do it. You were able to do it. So how do we not take the, the, what you guys have been able to do and spread that and just do it. We just have to do it. Like, you know, putting in Mohammed's KPI and he'll just have to do it because it's what he must do. Action, action, action. Uh, enough, yeah, because we've been talking for years now, almost decades, I would say. Um, Tara, what, what, what do you think is the biggest challenge when it comes to women trying to start and run and now we're being specific to tech-enabled uh, startups, given your experience with them, large experience. Um, I'll echo all the thanks for including, uh, including us here and having this important conversation. I think what I wanted to do maybe is bring up the segment of entrepreneurs who I think are not represented here and the challenges that they face. Um, you know, if you look across Sub-Saharan Africa, over 60% of people employed are in the agriculture sector and the, are, in, are specifically smallholder farmers. Smallholder farmers are, to me, the smallest form or the most micro of enterprise owners. And <clears throat> those women are systemically, systematically excluded from even more basic things than access to finance. They're actually excluded from access to identity. So, more than 45% of women who are smallholders and who are across sub-Saharan Africa lack access to a fundamental identity upon which they can even get a credit record or get access to basic things like um, land rights, like land ownership, like credit, like access to markets. And so as a result, these small entrepreneurs, which is what they are, they run small businesses, uh, can't buy seeds, can't buy fertilizers, can't sow the seeds. They lack the credit in the set terms of $10, $20 is the kind of credit that they're looking for. Um, and so I think that's a real key challenge, right? Because they live primarily in offline context. So to me, even before this notion of access to credit, it's really access to identity and making women visible. Do you, do you think of an initiative that worked towards uh, this or tackling this particular issue, uh, Tara? Do you have something in mind? Uh, maybe something that, an experience that worked somewhere? I mean, sure. Uh, I think, so I'm actually, as you mentioned, I'm the founder of a business, uh, an entrepreneurial business within MasterCard, the corporation, yep. um, that aims to tackle this very challenge. Okay. It aims to sort of, um, we build digital infrastructure. Uh, so, Clara, we have to talk after this. We build digital infrastructure that works offline in re remote and rural communities to give uh, individuals access to first a digital identity, but then leveraging that uh, collecting their data in a safe, secure manner that gives them access to credit, access to markets, um, access to buy things like inputs and fertilizer, which, you know, I think the First Lady had talked about sort of lifestyle challenges that women face because they have to take care of, they have household duties at home. And so there are structural barriers, um, like, for example, in many countries where there are fertilizer subsidies, those are located in town centers, which are two, three hours away from the village where they live. Women can't take that time off to go, uh, to go access the fertilizer subsidies. So they are relegated to having the substandard plots, the substandard fertilizers, the substandard seeds that they then 
plant on their local, and that results in sometimes 20 to 30 percent less productivity and income for them because they just don't have access to the same things. So digital is a way to overcome this, and digital that works in these offline contexts gives the women the identity, makes them actually seen. So that's what digital, I think, has the ability to do, is make these women seen and then get access to the credit and all the sort of services that, you know, I think where these ladies are starting, you know, for me, it's about bringing them up to at least the level where, you know, some other ladies are starting. Yeah. And yeah, then that's the idea. I mean, Yasmin was talking about the right idea to the startup, and this is just a great idea. It has the social impact, but there is a need, and it answers to a big need in, on, on the continent, which is a, which is a fact. Uh, Hanan, so on another scale, as a startup, would you tell us more about your personal journey, looking for the growth, for the financement, finance, fundings? Sure. So I'll go back to actually the my selection to the She Wins Arabia first cohort. Because, as I said, it was really a game changer. And I'll talk about the positive cascades of events that happened immediately after. So I was selected. I joined the African Diaspora Network and was selected among the top 11, well, actually, 11 entrepreneurs uh, as the 2022 builders of Africa's future and received a grant from the uh, US ADF, uh, US uh, African Development Foundation. And that I truly believe that this is all secondary to our selection to She Wins Arabia because it gave us the visibility, the exposure. Then we started working with USAID on the HIV surveillance program with Kenya. And we were selected at the US Africa Leaders Summit that was held last December in Washington, DC. We were only the two, one of the two um, ventures in the health access deal room, investors book, to make it so Biotesia was selected because there was a huge impact for Africa. Uh, it was, it was, I'm truly grateful to the She Wins Arabia initiative because I really believe that it was the trigger and the catalyst. So I'll just talk a little bit about our business and I know it may be music to your ears, but we all know that health access is a public health issue in Africa. And uh, I think the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic was, I think, brought a lot of emphasis on the health sector, health access, mainly due to the lack of testing, the affordability, and also the distance that populations have, travel, have to travel many hours to get tested. And it's still very heartbreaking to see that even today in Morocco, the second leading cause of death for women is cervical cancer, which can be prevented with a very easy HPV test. Or again, that the incidence of TB increased since the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, like in 2021, based on the UN report, we had 10.6 million people uh, sick from TB, and that 1.6 a million died uh, from TB, which is an increase of 4.5% in one year. So when you see these numbers, you are alarmed and you want to do something about it. So we have launched now, so um, we have launched a manufacturing plant made in Africa, by Africa, of these little, um, I'm showing everyone, so it, basically it's like biosampling tubes that are the perfect solution for Africa. You can collect saliva, blood, and transport at room temperature without cold chain anywhere in remote areas, underserved populations, and that's the way to bring access and, and, and prevent and diagnose early. So we have signed, and I'm very glad to share um, and follow our head of government conversation earlier this morning, the partnership, private-public. We are now signed MOUs with the Ministry of Investment, um, with uh, MDE, uh, which is the investment agency, and we are, the, uh, we are at the due diligence phase to receive funding from Charte de l'Investissement, the investment charter. So you need initiatives like this. You need government involvement and support. And last but not least, I'm very proud to say that talking about networking through IFC as well, I was at the World Government Summit uh, earlier this year in, in Dubai, and actually I connected very well with a fellow citizen Moroccan who has, actually she's a she winner from the second cohort, and now we are partnering together because the, we have now a solution where it's QR coded, we can, thank you very much. 
We are processing the results and all the labs very fast at low cost and we can upload into an electronic health record, a digital platform where patients can view their results online, but also healthcare providers. Any specialist involved in the care of the patient has access. And my dream will be that anyone in Africa will have that technology, access to healthcare, and, and there is no reason for us not to be able to do it. Thank you. Wow. Inspirational. Bravo. Um, okay. We heard about your inspirations, uh, Clara, before. What, what about your experience? Would you share with us maybe uh, some major moments or maybe challenges, but also opportunities that were there and that you, you just grabbed? Um, it was great hearing that you pitched to 160 because I pitched to 70 and uh, two said yes and most of them said no. So I thought 70 was very depressing hearing that no. <laughs> over and over and over and over again, you start to ask, is it me or is it them? But it's also a bit like dating. That's how I think about it. Like fundraising is about finding your match, people who understand what you're doing and understand um, the mission, the vision, and where you're trying to go. Um, some of the highlights have been having SoftBank as an investor. Um, they're one of the most prolific investors in the world. And um, having access to the network that that brings and the interest that also that brings because it's about FOMO. Everyone says if one person like that gets in, then there must be something here. So fundraising um, hasn't become easier, but I get a lot more interest. Um, so it's just about figuring out how to turn that interest into a yes. Um, the other things that have been great, I've had a fantastic career in fintech. I had a, I changed careers at 29. I used to work in international development. Um, and so being able to change careers um, at that late stage and be able to rise through the ranks has, has been fantastic. Working at big businesses and seeing how those were run and using that experience to um, build my own company. Um, women have been very key in helping us get through the door in a lot of funds. Um, they've always championed um, Credrails as a business. We're both female founders, so me and my co-founder are both women. And um, I will say that I wouldn't be here without women because women have always helped us go through the door. Women have opened their networks for me. Um, and women have honestly carried us when we keep hearing the no's um, and helped us get to those yeses. So. It's been it's been a good it's been a good ride. It's still hard, but I don't plan on giving up. Never. So, uh, Yasmin, what would be your advice to investors looking to maybe maximize the growth opportunity presented by uh, you or by your company? That, th this is a dangerous. Uh, this is a dangerous question. I hope there are not a lot of investors here. <laughs> Why not? So yeah, just to to be honest. No, um, I think for for investors uh, really to focus on the on the business model, uh, to focus um, and and all of the as we said the mindset. All of oh she's a woman like uh, for example, and I I said that in our panel in uh, in UAE. Um, I had once I was pitching and the investors were super, super engaged and I was like, this is going to happen now. And uh, in the question, uh, one of the people just asked me, he said, hey, you're married. Are you married? So, and, and I, I totally didn't understand the question because I was so focused to explain about the Kager and how much we grew and what's the market and the total addressable market. and. And it, he took me off guard, and uh, uh, and then I was a little bit rude. So I asked back, and I said, are you married? So he was like, again, took off guard. But I didn't understand the question. But I think the question was more, uh, we love it, but how committed are you to the business? Because of all we talked about, which is a fair thinking. I don't want to like blame them, but I mean, again, it's their money. They're worried about it, and they don't want to invest. And then you know, you have a commitment, uh, as uh, Her Excellency First Lady said, to balance everything with the home and the social pressure and all of that. So I think uh, um, what helped here is that I didn't take this personal. 
Because if I would have taken that personal, I would say, oh, he's so judgmental and all of that. I was like, listen, man, I'm not married. I have two daughters, 17 and 14. Don't worry about it. I have all the time of the world. And the guy was just like, I didn't mean it this way. I said, no, but it's okay, you know. So, so I mean, you, there is, there, there are issues and we just need to gain back the trust. For investors, I think, as I said, it is main, mainly on trusting and it is the same for a man or a woman. It is like, there are men, as um, as the IOC, Ms. Muhammad said, you know, the women under, uh, under promise and over deliver and men over promise. And I think now the world is turning, I'm, a, I'm so optimistic. So the world is turning towards women because all the men and all the collapses that happen in the world globally for the finances because they so over promised and they so under delivered so we had businesses that have been going from 6 billion and from my business and I don't mean African business I'm talking about European business in my sector where I am in logistics we have gorillas we have they were at 7 billion they went down I don't know how much and the, the, the amount of valuations that I was hearing I was like what is he doing I know his unit economics mine are better how did he get to a billion it is exactly because of that but I think the whole investors now they learn the lesson the hard way because their uh, money and investment have been slashed into half if not less sometimes they want to get their money at cost sorry to say that but uh, but now they are looking and they are pushing actually let's talk about it the men or business entrepreneurs in general men or women but because women generally do not overpromise so it's not a problem for women is no 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 give me the bottom line oh no 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 what's your unit economics so if each dollar i'm spending i'm losing two dollars man i'm not investing so the good news for women, there is a lot of dry powder, and the dry powder means a lot of investors are super worried to invest, so there is a lot of money with these investors, so there is money for us. The second thing is the investors, they learn the hard way, which is their valuation got slashed by half, if not even at cost. So it is good now that it is equalized between men and women, because everyone is looking at the unit economic, at the bottom line, and not only in GMV and all of this. So I think it's a good time. And I think investors also now have the openness, thanks to all of these initiatives and looking at businesses where they're going to have the ROI on, regardless of the gender. So, so that's that's my little word about your question. Thank you, Thank you, uh, uh, Yasmin and Zouera. Maybe a last question about what kind of interventions do you think could work to improve access for women? So I think the, the, the number one intervention that would work is around, I don't like the word capacity building, but it's the only one I can think of now, but it's like upskilling both the borrowers and the lenders in an equal, in an equal way. I think if, um, if lenders understand, if lenders have women in um, decision-making um, positions of authority, and if women are making a pitch that connects with what that lender is feeling, I think we'll see a big change. But the, the, the challenge is how do you build that capacity? Like, what does it mean? Like Clara said, like, she's not, we're not asking you to, it's not that women are going to change how we are, but it's how do we communicate what needs to be communicated in a way that our interlocutor is understanding what we're saying. That's the, I think that's the work. That, those are the interventions that I believe will work. And so the more we have these and the more we have successes and we have, you know, companies like Biotessa that are doing it, right, on a, on a big scale, the more, imagine if, you know, a younger you sees her, the multiplier effect of this, the multiplier effect of, you know, a young Egyptian girl, other girls seeing, but this is what women are doing, this is what can be done. That's how we're going to get there. But I think the key is that connect, the disconnect between the understanding and the presenting um, of projects and, and Thank you. Thank you, uh, Zouera. Last question uh, to uh, Tara. Uh, how can technology... I'm sorry? Okay. Maybe um, a final thought. 
to close up the, the, the discussion because it's I, the last question. I was just going to say I shouldn't be the one to close up. I think these uh, amazing sort of female entrepreneurs, uh, you know, should be the Because we were talking close. about like being uh, equal, so yeah, it's 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 a, it's it's for timekeeper as well. To be equal for all the speakers. Look, I think for me again, I just it's to bring back the voice of, you know, the smallest um, the smallest entrepreneur, which is that smallholder farmer, that woman who, like I said. Um, lacks access to sort of the most fundamental um, uh, capabilities like identity, like credit, like land. I think closing that gender gap is, um, and I think this is the point that I've heard all the panelists talk about, which is it's not just for women. It actually is benefiting the world, right? And how is it benefiting the world? It actually leads to greater economic productivity. I loved your point about um, investors now seeing the fact that this is just a better place to put your bets, right? I think for the smallholder farmer and for the for the closing that gender gap, if we can give those smallholders even the same access to identity, to credit, to land, to fertilizer, to inputs, we not only create over a trillion dollars in GDP globally, but we start to reduce the food insecurity issues that we face. So I think it's about changing our mindset to seeing that investment in women is good for the world. It's not just good for women. Amen to that. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. And I promised in my introduction that there will be uh, an announcement, very important announcement. And for that, I welcome back to the stage, Mohammed, uh, for this announcement. And your applause, ladies and gentlemen, please. Thank you very much uh, to, to all the panelists. This has been truly a wonderful discussion and, and very inspiring. And uh, thank you uh, for uh, uh, recognizing uh, the role uh, that IFC has played in a small way, maybe, uh, in, 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 in helping you come along your, uh, your entrepreneurial journeys. As we're uh, insightful and Tara, uh, especially talked about that, let's not forget about that small farmer uh, holder uh, who are, uh, a lot of them are women and don't have a digital identity. And I think uh, that's, uh, that's an area which, uh, which we, we need to pay particular attention to. Uh, that actually is bringing people out of poverty. Uh, but uh, it's my pleasure to announce the launch of what I would say is She Wins Africa. We started with She Wins Arabia. And uh, IFC has now decided to launch a similar initiative of She Wins Africa. Uh, it is, of course, going to be IFC's new gender program. And it's, again, aimed at enhancing uh, access to finance for women-owned startups. Uh, as we've heard today, uh, women-owned businesses face a major barrier, barriers in starting and growing their, their businesses. Uh, they face constraints in accessing finance, in accessing relevant entrepreneurship support, uh, but also services and networks, as well as information on funding. Uh, at the same time, evidence has shown that biased approach in evaluating uh, women-owned businesses uh, by investors, lock out many women uh, from accessing funding uh, opportunities. So as a result, there's a major gender gap, we know that, uh, in startup financing for women-owned businesses. What's interesting is that when you actually think about uh, African women and African women entrepreneurs, they represent 24 to 28 uh, percent of entrepreneurship. Uh, but they lack the finance. Uh, that, by, that number, by the way, is higher than the number you will see in Southeast Asia and Pacific. Uh, it's higher than the number in, uh, in the Middle East. And so clearly, uh, there is a certain level of uh, uh, ambition and resoluteness uh, when it comes to African women uh, starting businesses. And we see them and interact with them on a day-to-day basis. And you see that determination uh, and, and that ambition. So what's lacking here is giving them that little additional help and push uh, to, to, make, uh, to make them realize fully their potential, but also their dreams. 
to help address these challenges, I'm happy uh, again, as I said, to announce the She Wins Africa program. Uh, we intend initially to reach 300 women-owned businesses uh, with investment readiness uh, training, as well as coaching from level uh, support and facilitating uh, access to potential investors. Uh, so that would be done through matchmaking, and that would be done uh, through networking activities uh, with funds, uh, VC firms, but also other investors. Uh, she Wins Africa will also work with uh, funds and VCs in Africa uh, to accelerate the adaption of investment strategies that benefit women and improve the way investors evaluate women-owned startups for finance. Uh, thank you to all those who worked behind the scenes to launch this event. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Her Excellency uh, First Lady of uh, Namibia, Monica Giangos, uh, as well as uh, to the panelists for joining us today for the beginning of this campaign. And finally, big thank you to all our uh, uh, participants who came today to hear us out. And uh, thank you to Khadija for uh, being a wonderful moderator today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellency.